All right, let's get to a couple of the, the fight nights they have in this weekend. I want to end with UFC 205. Uh, Four-fight main card for UFC Fight Night 99. That was in Belfast, Northern Ireland, the UFC's first uh, portray into Northern Ireland. Um, some big wins on the undercard by Zach Cummings, submitting uh, Alexander Yakolov, as well as uh, two Michigan uh, products. So very s- proud to see Amanda Cooper win her first ever UFC fight, de- taking on the very tough Anna Elmos, who is making her strawweight debut. A very close fight, a very entertaining fight as well, but uh, Cooper just able to pull that one out. Um, you know, winning that third round, that late takedown, I think helped her secure the unanimous decision victory as she was able to defeat Ana Elmos. And then Kevin Lee had a very nice win over uh, Magomed Musta, Mustiev, as submitting him in the second round, actually uh, choking him out cold um, as Magomed didn't even tap. It was more of a neck crank. It was kind of under the chin. Uh, but very impressive performance there uh, by Kevin Lee um, as he was able to get, I think this is his second win since losing to uh, Santos um, late last year. So uh, big win for Kevin Lee. Yeah, oh, this is now his third win since losing to Santos uh, last year in, uh, in December. He has rattled off three victories, uh, being the likes of Efren Escudero, Jake Matthews, and now uh, Musiev. So he's really uh, right back kind of where he started. He had four wins in a row after losing his um, very uh, competitive debut in a loss to Ally Aquinta, uh, where he beat the likes of James Mutasseri and Michael Prezeras. But I think the guys he beaten here are actually more quality than the guys he had beaten um, before. So um, nice, uh, very nice, very underrated 2016 here for the Motown Phenom, uh, Kevin Lee, who now improves to 14 and 2 in his career. Uh, also here at um, Fight Night 99, uh, Alexander Volkov, or Volkov rather, uh, boy, he had a former Bellator product. He had a very nice uh, debut against Tim Johnson as he was able to win by unanimous decision, taking out uh, the big time uh, wrestler there, did a good job of keeping this fight standing. I thought he could be the better striker. Uh, really no more apparent than the 0 for 5 in takedowns Johnson was in the third round. At that point, just really desperate to get this fight to the ground. Um, and really, uh, besides that second round where he was able to land a takedown, probably the only round that you could have gave Tim Johnson was that second round. Uh, so very nice uh, performance there by Alexander Volkev, the former uh, Bellator champion there, taking out a pretty tough heavyweight there. Um, and Tim Johnson. The next fight uh, of the evening there in Belfast was the uh, co-main event of the evening. That was Stevie Ray against Ross Pearson. Uh, Pearson obviously originally supposed to be taking on James Krause. Uh, Stevie Ray was able to step in. Uh, Ray had been out of action for a while, had a little bit of an injury situation following his first ever UFC loss against Alan Patrick. Um, that was actually in September. Uh, kind of delayed his fight from his uh, third consecutive win there in October 2015. I think he saw a little bit of those effects um, in the Alan Patrick fight. And this fight, a very close fight um, between Ray and Pearson. Of course, Ray uh, admitted, you know, Ross Pearson was the guy he kind of looked up to, one of the first kind of bigger UK names. And really, this was a very close fight. I mean, look at the striking numbers. 50 to 48 in terms of land of strikes, slightly in favor for Ross Pearson. 104 thrown for Pearson to 119. The biggest difference being that one takedown. This was very a close fight. It seemed like both guys were very tentative. Not a whole lot of offense. Not a whole lot of damage landed. Um, but Stevie Ray getting a slight nod and probably the biggest win of his career. And for Ross Pearson, a guy that kind of had built up uh, some nice momentum. To me, really, uh, this was back in 2013 uh, when he had won you know, three out of four fights, uh, beating Junior Asuncio, George Sardaropoulos, and, and Ryan Couture. That was his... Uh, you know, return to the 155 division after a brief stint at uh, 155. And then he had the no contest there against Melvin Gillard, um, which was the the illegal blow. Then he had that loss to Diego Sanchez, which probably should have been the win. And then he beat Gray Mater, knocking him out in the second round. He had a lot of hype coming into the fight against uh, Al Iaquinta, lost that fight, kind of got back on the winning track there, uh, knocking out Sam Stout but then got dominated by Evan Dunham, did beat uh, Paul Felder, then he had the bad fight losing to Trinaldo, 
came back, barely beat Chad Laprise. Um, that was actually in March in this, this year. And actually, he's fought five times this year. This is Ross Pearson's fifth fight. Uh, has only gone one and four. He did take uh, the... F Will So he loses Trishnal. It was a bad fight. Then comes back, beats Laprise. Fights Will Brooks, which, again, he was supposed to take on uh, James Krause. Will Brooks was a late replacement. Close fight, but definitely lost. Then steps up on short notice in the welterweight division. However, Jorge Masvidal is a former lightweight himself. So, I mean, you know, not a big deal. On short notice, less than a month later, fights Masvidal. Close fight, again, lost. Then he was supposed to fight James Krause again here in, in Belfast. Gets another late replacement. And he's kind of just been on bad luck, you know, uh, a lot lately. It's not like he's getting dominated in any of his fights. It's just, uh, you know, he just hasn't really been able to put together, you know, a solid run really after his first um, forte uh, into the UFC going back to 2009 where he rattled off his first th uh, three fights were victories. So for Ross Pearson, definitely a guy that maybe towards the end of his career – Obviously, he fought five times, which is awfully impressive, but definitely he's got to start looking towards retirement because once you start losing a lot of these close fights, that really wears on you mentally and physically. And while he hasn't been out of a lot of these fights, it still shows that you know people are starting to pass him by. That's all. And while he is still a, a good fighter in his own right, it's definitely um, he doesn't have a lot left to... Uh, in the tank, I think, in my opinion. And, you know, we're really at this stage in his career, he's not going to get back to, uh, you know, being a contender or anything. This division's too stacked right now. But uh, he had a good run, you know, while he was at it there. The main event of the evening, Gagar Musasi against Uriah Hall for the second time. Really, both guys kind of were feeling each other out. Not a lot was happening. Um, some nice, a couple of nice leg kicks by Hall. He did land one pretty good uh, spinning kick uh, to the chest. The biggest uh, blow was probably from a jab that uh, Uriah, or excuse me, um, Gegard Musasi had. And then kind of a, a quick combination there by Musasi uh, towards the end of the first round in a nice flurry. Kind of dropped Hall. Hall was kind of turtling up a little bit there, there, there uh, in the corner. And Gegard kept on with the damage, just kept on coming there with that right hand. Wasn't doing much to get out of position. The referee had to come in and stop this one uh, right towards the end of the first round. I think it was 422 into the first round as uh, Musasi was able to avenge that loss uh, from Japan. Uh, I believe that was September of last year, uh, a little over a year ago. And uh, win another fight here in the UFC um, after his great victory there over Vitor Belfour. Now follows up with this great first round knockout here of Uriah Hall, again avenging that loss. And... This really puts the middleweight division in an interesting picture. Yoel Romero, who I'll get, we'll get to in just a moment, was victorious at UFC 205. The UFC went ahead and said that he is going to be the top contender for the middleweight division and will fight and will face Michael Bisping at some point in 2017. That puts Jacques Ray Souza, who was supposed to take on Luke Rockhold this coming weekend in Australia a rematch uh, between the two when they fought for the Strike Force Middleweight Championship. That fight obviously off. Many thought maybe Jacare then would fight Bisbing, regardless of how Romero and Weidman played out. However, Romero does own a win over Jacare Souza, um, which again wasn't overturned due to the tainted uh, substance thing. They still gave him a suspension. So Romero kind of does get back that number one consensus that he had lost um, in that very close fight with Jacare. So... That still puts Jacare in an interesting position. Does he now have to wait for Luke Rockhold? Does that fight still materialize? Now you got Musasi out there. Jacare has already fought Musasi uh, twice now, each of them with a win. So does that set up Musasi Jacare 3 for a possible number one contender? Then, of course, even though the fight with Rockhold and Jacare is off, there's still a big fight in the middleweight division that is main eventing in Australia, as you have uh, Robert Whitaker against Derek Brunson. That's a huge fight there. Brunson coming off that uh, big win there over Uriah Hall. And uh, Robert Whitaker, I believe, is coming off that win over Rafael Natal. So a win by either. They shoot up the rankings as well. So does that possibly put Jacare against the winner of Brunson and Rockhold? Remember, 
uh, Jacare does have uh, a knockout victory over Derek Brunson, and I think what was the second to last ever Strike Force event. So, yeah, you know how how you know so really interesting here with Musasi taking this fight as quick as he did after the win uh, over Vitor Belfort. So that really kind of puts the middleweight division to flux. And then you got, well, when does Luke Rockhold return? You know, when is he going to be ready to go? And obviously, how quickly can Chris Weidman recover from that devastating knee he took from Yoel Romero? Uh, it might be a while considering Chris Weidman. Uh, so, I don't know. The, the middleweight division is definitely in flux right now. Uh, <laughs> when you can kind of thank Gegard Musasi because of that. So, a lot of interesting fights that could be made. Obviously, this weekend, I think, has to play out before any other other contender status fights are made. But to me, Rockhold matches up either against Chris Weidman or possibly the loser of this fight uh, between Whitaker and Brunson or Gegard Musasi. And then Jacare either fights Musasi for a third time or faces the winner of Brunson or Whitaker. Uh, I kind of... That's kind of how I see it in my head. I don't know if that's how it's actually going to play out, but we'll see. <laughs> Let's get to uh, now UFC Fight Night 99 that was held the same day, uh, Saturday, November 19th, uh, and Bellator was going on. So you had two UFC fights and a Bellator fight all going on in one day. Um, on the undercard, very nice uh, victory from Pedro Munoz as he was able to take out Justin Scoggins, who they kind of forced up to bantamweight after missing weight several times in the flyweight division. He gets a performance of the night bonus, a big win for him. Uh, Johnny Eduardo, big win over Manville Gamburian, knocking out him in the second round. Uh, Gaza Hermit Antulov was able to beat uh, Marco Rodrigo uh, de Lima, submitting him in the first round. That was a performance of the night bonus. And then Cesar Fajeda, uh, back up in the middleweight division, took out Jack Hermanson. Uh, big victory for uh, Fajeda there, or Mushanche, as he was able to win by arm triangle choke in the second round. Uh, getting to the main card, uh, interesting fight there between Sergio Moraes and Zach Otto. Um, Otto, you know, they were saying, oh, he's more known of a grappler. You know, Sergio didn't see a lot. Of, I don't know, you got to see a lot of his stand-up uh, in his win a little over a month ago in Portland over Josh Berkman. Um, however, the looping punches of Murray's, I think Otto uh, had trouble and really was Otto wasn't throwing a lot of power shots. He was throwing some nice combinations. It, it looks to be the better striker, don't get me wrong, but the big power shots were coming from Murray's. Also, uh, in the first round, Murray's really dominated with that takedown. Uh, definitely is the better grappler of the two. Uh, you know, the next two rounds were definitely close. Uh, I thought Otto probably took one of them, uh, probably definitely took the second, and the third was close. I think you can make a case that Zach Otto won this fight, but the power shots were, even though they were kind of slow, a little labored, um, you know, those hooks were landing, and I, and I think the judges uh, took that, um, you know, being closer to finish the fight, and that's why uh, Moraes was able to get the uh, split decision nod there down in Brazil. Kamar Usman against Warrior Alves. After a pretty good first round by Alves, uh, who definitely had some good striking combinations, had uh, Usman, I think, in a lot of trouble in that first round, was able to keep, keep this fight standing. Um, towards the end of the first round, I think Usman started to get off on his striking a little bit. I think went into the second round with a lot of confidence. And, and Alves, uh, I think at that point, just he kind of ran out of gas. I think he tried to max out maybe a little bit in that first round, coupled with uh, Usman really starting to pick up his own striking game. And really from about a minute, two minutes into the second round, this was all Kamar Usman, who to me really showed a maturation in his game, a guy that can bang, a guy that can take some shots. You know, we really hadn't seen his chin been tested too much. And then obviously in the third round, completely dominated, outstriking him. 64-1! to one. With a takedown, uh, just absolute dominance, probably a 10-8 round. Um, so, you know, other than that good first round, this was a good performance by Usman, not just in the fact he used the striking, but the fact that he showed that he can be a competent striker, that he can take a punch, 
that he is willing to try to finish guys. He's not just a guy that takes people down and blankets them. Um, I believe Aiken and Stan were, were talking about that in the broadcast. But this was a very good fight in the maturation of Kamar Usman becoming a legit welterweight prospect. He has all the physical tools there, but adding uh, this wrinkle into his game where he can uh, stand, he doesn't have to wrestle people, he can take a punch as well. That's uh, big news, and Warley Alves, is, uh, Warley Alves is definitely a tough guy doing that uh, in his home country of Brazil. Uh, I thought a very excellent performance by the former Ultimate Fighter, uh, Kamara Usman, in this fight. Christoph Jaco, boy, what a excellent performance against uh, one of the top middleweights in the world and one of the best Brazilian jiu-jitsu artist to ever step inside the UFC. Uh, just just put on a clinic. I mean, he shut Leitez down in the stand-up category. I mean, one of eight only was able to land that uh, takedown in the first round and then an absolute wash in the striking. It just seemed like Leitez had no answer once again in the striking department. Uh, he looked pretty shallow in that fight against Gegard Mousasi. Um, obviously, you know, Watched uh, Kamuzi in, in the meantime, in the interim, you know, with a great grappling performance. But Christoph Jaco, man, ninety-three to four in terms of landed strikes. This fight went fifteen minutes, and Talas Leites only landed four strikes. I don't. I, that has to be a record. A full fifteen minutes, and the guy landed four strikes. That's insane. I mean. It ain't that hard to land four strikes, even their little, you know, pitter patter, uh, Jake Shield soft pillow fist fight punches. <laughs> I mean, that's incredible. I don't know if I've ever seen that big a disparity for a fight that went 15 minutes. I mean, 93 to four. He only threw, threw, 14 strikes. That's one strike a minute, actually less. That's insane. It went 15 minutes. He's one of the top 15 middleweights in the world. And he got and he looked like garbage. A guy that's fought for the world championship. A guy that's been a world champion jiu-jitsu guy. A guy that I thought beat Michael Bisbing about 18 months ago in Scotland, standing up, throwing nearly 200 strikes in the 25-minute 20, fight. Uh, I don't know what has happened to Talos Leites, but after that Michael Bisbing fight, he has been a, a remarkably diminished fighter after having a really nice rise since returning to the organization, um, I think less than two years ago, maybe a little over two years ago now. Um, uh, I guess he's done. I don't, I don't know what it is, but I don't, it was equally as a bad performance for Leitas as it equally was a good performance by Christoph Jaco. As he obviously, uh, despite coming in you know, with not having the better fighter, a little bit of an underdog, to me, proved himself. Uh, this guy's definitely going somewhere. Um, Polish fighters are on the rise, uh, as you can see the Polska flag back there. But just an absolute impressive performance. He shut him down. He had some top control. He went into deep waters a couple of times and just he outclassed Talos Leites. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I, I thought Leites, uh, not that he won this fight too easily, but boy, I, I thought it'd be, you know, I thought he could do a lot better than this. I mean, this was kind of pathetic, to be honest. I mean, you look at those numbers, and it, it shows a fight that, you know, you would think, like, Talos Leites, the guy's on the top ten? This is how he fought? Not a top ten performance. Uh, absolutely. I don't, I don't know if he gets cut, but, man, uh, he definitely lost any momentum he had at, at trying to get back in a title run with a performance like this. And in his home country, no less. Um but all the credit the world for Christoph Jaco. He's um, definitely a fighter that's on the rise and a guy that very uh, obviously gets a, a pretty big-time opponent um, for his next fight as well. Next fight of the evening, Claudia Gadella against Courtney Casey. Casey, um, you know, really stepping up the quality of her opponent. Um, you know, had won some pretty nice fights, uh, you know, back-to-back -back there um, against Stan Shu and Randa Marcos, uh, submitting both those uh, Ladies now taking on Claudia Gadella, the former title challenger, had only lost to one woman uh, in her entire life, and that being the champion, Joanna Jacek. So Gadella fighting in her home country, I think for the first time under the UFC banner, you know, did what she does best. You know, she took this fight to the ground, had six takedowns, was successful on every single one. I mean, Casey made an effort. She was definitely throwing off her back. She was trying, 
but at the same time, she was getting held in those positions. She wasn't escaping enough um, to really uh, have this fight be standing. Yeah, there was that illegal kick that kind of glanced off the top of the head towards the bun there of Courtney Casey. Did it affect Casey in that round, in that third round? Absolutely. But I think at that point, even if they would have gave her a point deduction, which definitely should have, Brian Stan calling out the uh, officials and uh, referees that were part of that event, absolutely should have been taken a point away. Even if you add that in, Gadella clearly won rounds one and two, even if that round is judged as a 9-9, which I would have, still given Gadella winning that round uh, with the point deduction, I still would have called it a 9-9. That still gives her the win. You know, it makes it a little bit of a blemish. However, Gadella, I think, had some chances to win this fight sooner, uh, but didn't. And that's not to take anything away from Courtney Casey, because she, she held game. And she took that fight in short notice. They mentioned that during the camp, um, you know, she was overcoming rehab from an auto accident. Didn't let that slow her down. I mean, she had a lot of things that a lot of fighters wouldn't have even taken that fight, especially considering the caliber of opponent, and in Brazil, no less. You know, of course, Courtney Casey's just a game fighter. That, that's really all it is. And, uh, you know, with a full camp and out that injury, I really would like to see, you know, Courtney try another caliber opponent like that again. To me, she proved that she can fight anybody's division and hang with them. And for Claudia, uh, yeah, she got the win, but that's not the type of fight that makes me think that she's ready to get back into title contention. So... I really want to see a matchup with Carla Esparza. Of course, that fight was supposed to be scheduled a couple times uh, when two were in the Invicta organization for the Invicta Strawway Championship. So if that fight can materialize at some point in time, that, I think, is the fight I would like to see Claudia take on next. If not, um, I think a Rose Dom Yunez would be a good matchup. Uh, maybe even Alexa Grasso. I, I think that's solid. As far as what's next for the strawweight division, I think very likely if Paige Van Zant gets by Michelle Waterson, that could be Paige's opportunity to fight uh, Yoan. Now, I, I don't think they're going to run back. Obviously, actually, Carolina could be a good matchup for Claudia, too. So there are some matchups out there, but I think if Paige gets by Waterson, they could make that fight. Because to me, right now, there's not that strong of a number one contender. Obviously, Jessica Andrade is the girl that could shoot up. Now, she's only had two fights. She beat Jessica Penne, yeah, who was coming off a year layoff in the loss to Joanna, and then she rolled through Calderwood. I would like to see Andrade get one more fight in, but with the lack of contenders, maybe Andrade shoots up there, uh, and maybe we see the winner of Paige Watterson take on someone like a Carolina or a... Um, uh, Alexa Grasso. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but right now, you know, Joanna can take a break because she's deserved it. You know, she's beaten the best in the world. This is now her fourth uh, title defense. So to me, the UFC needs a little time to even create a contender. So it kind of works out uh, for Joanna anyway to take a little bit of a break and probably return sometime in March or April. That might be good enough time to uh, get a contender going for this division. Next matchup here, uh, coming event, Thomas Almeida against Albert Morales. Morales only his second fight ever in the UFC, taking on top 15 bantamweight in uh, Thomas Almeida, who's coming off, uh, even though it was a loss, it was a pretty good fight there um, against uh, Cody Garbrandt. He came out of the wrong end, but, you know, that's the way he fights. He fights uh, dangerous. Morales definitely had some chances in the fight, definitely hurt Almeida at a couple points, but you know, overall, Almeida just a little more skilled, a little more seasoned, and uh, you know, obviously got a boost, I think, from the crowd fighting there in Brazil and uh, got back to the winning track, knocking out Morales in the second round. And Morales, I, I think, surprised Almeida. There probably wasn't that much tape of Morales. You know, kind of there was that one decision. And maybe, obviously, a little underestimation of Morales' skills, having this only been his uh, eighth professional fight ever. Uh, I think he just kind of caught Almeida by surprise. Almeida was able to adjust and uh, come out like the uh, true warrior that he is with the knockout and a guy that kind of reasserts himself as one of the top bantamweights in the division despite taking, like I said, only this was his eighth professional fight. 
Uh, Thomas Almeida is still a very dangerous out for anyone in this bantamweight division. And yes, I know he fought and lost against Cody Garbant getting knocked out in the first round, but I still think if it runs back. Almeida still has a very good chance to knock out Cody Garbrandt. And that's not to take away from Cody's victory because he obviously won and he deserved that victory. But that's a fight because of both guys' power can really go any way. It really does. And the fact that guys are so young uh, as well, that matchup I'm, I'm sure will be run back at some point and will we'll probably end with a devastating finish uh, the second time as well or even the third time. Main event of the evening, not really much to say. Uh, Little Nogs, he's done. Um, he was supposed to take on Gustafson. Gustafson got hurt. You know, Bader trying to get that long-awaited title shot. And really in a weak light heavyweight division with John Jones, you know, being out till June, might be able to. I mean, other than the loss to Anthony Johnson, since December of 2013, he has won seven of eight fights. He's beaten the likes of Fei Zhao, OSP, Phil Davis, Rashad Evans, Alir Latifi, and now Little Nog for a second time. And really, he's only lost to some of the best in the world. I mean, he's only lost to John Jones in 2011. Then he had that kind of lapse there against Tito Ortiz. He had a loss to Leona Machida in August of 2012. And he lost to Glover in September of uh, 2013. Does also hold a victory over Rampage Jackson. But realistically, if Daniel Cormier beats Rumble Johnson again, if that does happen, presumably you would think Cormier might fight one more time before a possible rematch with John Jones, considering Jones, I think he's scheduled to come back in June, but obviously with camp and time, I don't know if they would schedule that for July, if they would kind of wait, depending on how the fight goes and feels. Obviously, Cormier kind of took a only fought once so far this year, and he lost on a lot of money because of the John Jones debacle because he got hurt, uh, or obviously in April, which lost him some money too. And even though he did take the fight against Anderson Silva, so Cormier again with not that many fights, maybe wanting to take another one. Um, obviously, Rumble losing it does hurt the division because. You know, Rumble getting two shots at the title and losing, despite not having fought John Jones, definitely doesn't make that one as appealing. So, Ryan Bader, a guy that can just accumulate victories, could by by proxy just eventually get a title shot for just being the only guy who hasn't got one yet. So, good on him for taking this victory, but pretty much knew how this one was going to be play out. Uh, you know, he gets the stoppage, which is good, but. Little Nog should definitely retire. Um, I don't think it would have been much different had he taken on Gustafson. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> this was um, yeah, this was kind of sad to watch, really. It just just wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't that entertaining. You know, all the credit in the world to to Bader for, for you know, stepping up and taking the fight. But, you know, Little Nog just, just has nothing left. And um, But Bader... Just maybe short of uh, just hanging around, maybe able to to get that long awaited title shot. And there already kind of was some heat between Cormier and Bader. I think before Gustafson had gotten the shot, you know, Bader was trying to make a claim for a title. Um, obviously, it looked like he might do that before they had John Jones re enter the picture, you know, to do the rematch, which would have been in April of this year. So Bader kind of got passed up for that, and at that point had lost to Rumble Johnson. So. Bader maybe could end up getting there. I think in the meantime, possibly Bader against um, Jimmy Manuel with Manuel coming off that knockout victory over OSP. To me, that's probably the most likely match to make because that's the only other thing. Possibly Glover. I don't know. I think Glover uh, might be done after losing to Rumble Johnson too, so I don't know. That could be a fight. But really, other than Glover and Manuel, I'm not really sure who else Bader would fight in the top ten. Realistically. All right, let's get to UFC 205. Uh, going over to the undercard real quick. Uh, big win there um, for Liz Carmouche as she was able to get uh, back on the winning track, uh, defeating uh, up-and-coming prospect uh, Caitlin uh, Chu Kagan. Uh, was able to win by split decision. Uh, Carmouche really um, kind of ha has had a tough go of it uh, 
you know, lately really hasn't fought much since since making her UFC debut, the first ever uh, women's fight back in 2013. She had lost three out of four fights, had actually lost, uh, you know, had the one win over Jessica Andrade, which now doesn't seem like that big of a victory considering Andrade is now in the strawweight division. However, did return, uh, has only fought three times in the last um, three years, once in 2014. Uh, that was a loss to Misha Tay. She only fought once in 2015. She did beat Lauren Murphy. Lauren Murphy's kind of had her ups and downs. Actually, Murphy just lost to Caitlin Chukagan uh, earlier this year. Now picks up a split decision victory. So she has won two in a row, but, um, you know, definitely, uh, you know, the the infrequency of her fights has really kind of kept her from uh, being really relevant in a division that she helped start. <laughs> um, but big victory for her uh, being a part of this fight. Uh, then there was the Jim Miller Tiago Alves debacle, which I'm not sure how many of you followed the, this out there, but if you did, Tiago Alves again probably should have never even attempted to move to 155. Tried, failed miserably. Uh, New York, with his new regulations, said any fight where a fighter misses weight can't be more than five pounds within each other, regardless of the actual weight miss. So Jim Miller, who had already made weight, had to re weigh in heavier and within five pounds to meet. Tiago uh, Alves missed weight, so this fight could take place. Of course, there was already a weight issue with Calvin Gastelum, who didn't even attempt to make weight uh, at the UFC 205 weigh-ins, which canceled his fight against Cowboy Cerrone. Cowboy then rebooked for 206 um, against Matt Brown. Calvin Gastelum is now permanently forced to fight in the middleweight division. They had already previously forced him up to 185. Uh, after winning that fight allowed him to, to move back to welterweight. However, now this is the final straw. They're no longer allowing Gaston to fight at 185, and I think you're going to see start to see this a lot more. Obviously, John Lineker was forced to fight a bantamweight. Justin Scoggins, they just did that. But, you know, guys can't make weight with these regulations. They're, they're going to force you to fight up, and it's going to show you you can't keep on missing weight. Once, okay, twice, but three times, that's it. It's three strikes you're out. I think that's going to be the policy there and Gaslam definitely uh, hit that three strikes policy um, so you know de definitely uh, kind of glad Jim Miller could do this and he gets the victory um, obviously Al was just completely drawn out and just you know wasn't able to stop the takedowns just I don't know really what Alves was thinking he was already a guy that seemed like a cut a lot of weight for for 170 so making 155 um, I, I don't think the UFC one shouldn't let him attempt it again and two he shouldn't even attempt it personally uh, I don't think there's a lot left in Alva's career anyway, but if he wants to fight, stay at 170, my man. All right, getting to the uh, FS1 uh, prelims portion of the card. Awesome victory by Vincent, uh, Vincente Luque as he was able to take on uh, Bilal Muhammad. This was a short-notice uh, pickup fight for Vincente. Vincente, having spent a lot of time in his life living in New Jersey, big fight for him, uh, of course, fighting at... Uh, Madison Square Garden, Muhammad, obviously a guy who's had a pretty good UFC career since coming in earlier this year, had an awesome fight with uh, Alan Jaboy, even though it didn't come his way, had a big win over uh, Augusto Montano back in September, and, and this fight uh, just two months later, taking on Luque, got knocked out, but a guy that still is a you know good prospect, has a bright future, and for Luque, uh, really since losing to Michael Graves, a guy that really was a heavy uh, grappler on that season of the Ultimate Fighter, uh, that was in July of last year, has looked nothing short of fantastic. He's fought four times um, since December of 2015. So really, in a year, he's fought four times, four finishes. He's beaten some pretty good fighters. Hader Hassan, Hector Habina, and now Bilal Muhammad, uh, two by submission, two by knockout, two performance of the night bonuses. And this is a kid that... Even though you know lost to Michael Graves was you know didn't fight in the championship fight of the finale, but was one of the only other guys to to get a fight on that finale for that season, the Ultimate Fighter 21 ATT versus Black Zillions. I thought as a guy that had a tremendous amount of potential, and he's really showing it as of late and stepping up and being a good quality fighter like Muhammad on short notice on the biggest stage ever there at Madison Square Garden for this type of card. Uh, I thought was awfully impressive, and I think probably gets a, a pretty big name, um, or a bigger name, I should say, for his next fight, and probably gets a top 15 opponent, and, and deservingly so, and um, a kid that's really easy to root for, and has just had uh, tremendous performance after tremendous performance, um, you know, after having that setback in his debut. Tim Bosch against Natal. 
Good fight for Bosch. Uh, Natal, I really think after that, you know, big kind of run he had up there leading up to his fight with uh, Robert Whitaker earlier this year, just, uh, you know, where he won four fights in a row, being the likes of Tom Watson, Uriah Hall, Kevin Casey, and Chris Camuzzi, has really kind of uh, fallen flat his last two fights. Did not have a great fight at 197 against Whitaker. And this fight kind of looked lackadaisical. Uh, really let Tim Bosch, the shorter guy, get inside with those big power shots, and the Barbarian was able to finish him quickly. And that probably ends, you know, Natal's uh, run he had here to the title. I mean, he was had he beat Robert Whitaker, his fortunes really change. Um, but losing now to Whitaker, even though he was ranked, but now an unranked Tim Bosch, definitely sets him way behind the ball. Um, you know, a guy that kind of had his ups and downs, obviously had at one point, um, you know, was 5-2, and one, you know, had lost to Tim Kennedy and Ed Herman, you know, solid competitors uh, in 2013 and 2014. But, you know, since 2014, September, you know, had really kind of made a roll of things. Uh, but now that roll seems to be gone. And I'm not sure what he has to change differently, but definitely has to find that aggressive nature, nature back if he wants to continue because he's looked uh, like a guy that doesn't really want to get into striking wars with people. And if you're not really willing to engage with guys, you're going to get beat. And there's really no surprise that he lost again. It's just uh, Bosch was able to find that right punch and knock him out. Like I said uh, earlier in the broadcast, Habib Nurmagomedov just dominating Michael Johnson despite some early troubles uh, by the former Ultimate Fighter, um, or I'm sorry, despite some early troubles by the Russian from the former Ultimate Fighter runner-up, Habib at that point was able to uh, really dominate from about a minute half in to the second round and really put uh, Johnson struggling for the whole time. That second round, very dominant, eventually was able to wear him down to get a Kimura attempt submission, 231 into the third round. Habib, along with Tony Ferguson uh, the, uh, the previous weekend that I covered, definitely made a case for a championship uh, fight. I don't know if it materializes. I don't know, like I said, I think RDA, um, or rather Tony Ferguson beating RDA, I think is a bigger deal than Habib beating Michael Johnson. Despite how dominant it was. I, I, I think it was a more impressive performance. Both were impressive, don't get me wrong. But uh, I, I just think it's also a funner fight too. That's just me, but uh, we'll see. I don't know. Any, anything can happen. Last fight, Frankie Edgar against Jeremy Stevens. Jeremy Stevens definitely had, you know, a, a couple of chances. He definitely had Frankie hurt a couple of times. But overall, you know, the takedown attempts um, and, and the ground control were really what able to get Frankie the win. I mean, he wasn't hugely successful. I mean, 5 of 14 is not hugely successful by any means. But he tied Stevens up enough and the threat of a takedown enough uh, to win this fight. And for Frankie, a guy that... I think at one point would have been Conor McGregor's biggest test at 145 pounds, but now after the all the fight, you can tell this is a guy that is still good, but you can definitely tell is now on the back end of his career. I mean, the guy's 35 years old. Conor McGregor's in the prime of his life. I'm not saying Frankie has no chance of winning, but I think that window of, of Frankie beating Conor has kind of gone now. Um, I really think he would have a, tr a trouble, um, have a lot of trouble defeating Conor McGregor. I mean, he had a split decision against, you know, Jeremy Stevens. Not taking anything away from Jeremy Stevens, but Jeremy Stevens is not Conor McGregor. So, you know, credit, you know, Stevens had a solid fight, but again, you know, uh, wasn't able to do enough when it was striking um, to get the victory. Getting to the main card, uh, Raquel Pennington, very impressive performance. You know, I almost picked her. I went Misha Tate. You know, I probably should have went more with Pennington. Um, but, you know, Misha Tate, after the fight, ended up actually retiring. Kind of surprised me a little bit. But Pennington was just able to shut her down completely in the takedown category. And when it came to standing, I think the punishment Tate took, uh, you know, in her last fight against Nunes, maybe a little drained physically as well, just didn't have it in her. It just didn't seem like she had that same confidence striking uh, as she had previously um, in some other fights in her career. And just, you know, if she wasn't getting on the ground, she just wasn't in there. And even the grappling exchanges, uh, Pennington was just out-beating her, out-hustling her. You know, just had more heart there. 
wanted it more. And it just seemed like, uh, you know, Tate just... I'm not saying that she still couldn't compete. I see why she retired. You know, she was retiring before she completely gets passed up by the division. I get that. But, um, you know, maybe losing to someone she coached on the Ultimate Fighter also kind of prompted as well. I mean, if she won, maybe she wouldn't have retired. But I think she kind of saw, like, hey, look, I can still compete, but, you know... uh, it doesn't look like it, it's my time anymore. You know, the, some of these girls have kind of passed me by, and you know, Pennington, obviously my former student, so to speak, even though it was on a reality show, beat you. Maybe you got to take a look at yourself. And um, you know, I commend her uh, on her career. I mean, she captured both the Strike Force and UFC championship. Um, definitely a pioneer in women's MMA, and has been a pretty solid announcer when she's done Invicta. So she definitely has a career ahead of her. Um, you know, and definitely, I think, should be in the UFC Hall of Fame. I mean, I know she didn't defend the UFC championship, but she did capture it. And to me, she had one had the greatest comeback and championship performances in UFC history. I mean, needing that finish like she did in the fifth round against Holly Holm and getting it was huge. And there are very few fights, um, there are very few fights in any type of circumstance where fighters need a finish to win a fight and they get it. And she did that. And to me, that that fight alone... Um, makes her a Hall of Fame candidate, in my opinion. So uh, at some point in time, I'm sure she'll find herself there. And for Pennington, this is huge. She really shoots up the rankings in the women's bantamweight division. I don't know if she fights for the title next. I think we may see a title eliminator at some point get announced between um, Shevchenko and Juliana Pena. Now, Now maybe throws Pennington... Uh, it's hard to say who she would because she's already beaten Betch. I, maybe a rematch with Holly Holm. Holm now with the two losses and coupled in with Pennington now on this roll, just having beat Misha, I'm not sure how attractive of a fight that would be. Uh, I think possibly Kat Zingano? might be a name that's out there. However, Zagano, it seems as though the division's kind of passed her by as well, um, you know, getting beat by Pena there at UFC 200. I'm not sure how much Cat has left in the tank, but she puts herself in an interesting situation, that's for sure. Uh, it's a good situation for the UFC to have uh, with all these contenders coming. Obviously, they already announced uh, Ronda against Amanda Nunes for the title coming up at uh, New Year's Eve. So, I don't know. We'll see. A lot has to play out here for the the title picture, but it's definitely very intriguing. Not quite as crowded as the middleweight division, but definitely intriguing nonetheless. Yoel Romero against Chris Weidman. Uh, pretty solid fight, really. Um, you know, it was very competitive. I thought both guys had their chances. Weidman actually took down Romero, which I think might have been the first time Romero had ever gotten taken down, briefly in the first round. Probably cemented the round there for him. Round two, he got shut down a couple times, and I think Romero started to kind of figure out what Weidman was doing. He got a couple of takedowns. Probably was one run entering that round. Round three, however, Romero kind of coming out of nowhere with a huge flying knee, caught Weidman ducking in for a takedown, completely busted open the former champion. Probably the, the round should have been called right there. Yamasaki probably couldn't see from the angle how badly Weidman was hurt. A couple more punches from Romero, and he was able to knit this thing up 24 seconds into the third round. And an overall impressive performance. Uh, being a guy that's like a workhorse, known for his conditioning and, and work ethic, and Chris Weidman being able to take him out like that, uh, awfully impressive. And that may kind of signal the end of kind of Chris Weidman's uh, run as being one of the top contenders here. Um, you know, Weidman, despite only having 15 pro fights, you know, he is starting to, I believe now he's, um, let's see, he's th- going to be 33 years old, now off back-to-back losses, getting knocked out in both of them, you know, despite having three title defenses uh, from 2013 to 2015, coupled in all of those injuries he's had in that, you know, standpoint, you know, since winning the title in July of, you know, 2013, you know, has fought six times in three years, but has had a lot of injuries in that time, too. So I, I think a lot of those are starting to add up. You know, he had another, 
injury uh, you know, leading up to this fight. Of course, that's what forced him out of his fight earlier this year against Luke Rockhold. So, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I don't know if he's completely done, but this is definitely a, this is a fight where it, this was a career changer type of damage. That, that's for sure. And a career builder for Yo Romero as it looks as though he will be fighting for the middleweight title next against Michael Bisping. And he's going to be a force to be reckoned with, uh, the former uh, Olympic wrestler out of Cuba. Uh, just an excellent performance and really put a stamp on that. You know, and honestly, it's kind of a blessing in disguise because I think have, had he got the shot over um, after beating Jacare in that kind of split decision close fight, where it's kind of unsure, like, oh, I don't know if Romero can hang. Now having this performance, to me, <coughs> excuse me, I can see why the UFC went ahead and booked that matchup because this was a splash fight and a big fight for Romero to make a name off of. Ioannia J. Checks against Carolina Kovalkovich, or Kovalkovich, rather. What can I say? Another dominant performance by uh, Ioana Champion. And, and really, besides probably that fourth round um, where Kovalkovich was able to kind of wobble Ioana a little bit, um, that was really about the only sign of, of trouble with that right hand. Otherwise, this fight, when I said at range, you know, Carolina would have to get in the inside and clinch. That would be your best option. Honestly, even when it was in close and by the clinch, Ioana was getting the better of her with the elbows, the knees, changing a position. I mean, this was just an absolute dominant 25-minute performance. I mean, you got to credit Kovalkiewicz for hanging tough. I mean, she absorbed 181 strikes, did get taken down once briefly in the fourth round. Um, you know, And just the, the pace she couldn't make. I mean, throwing 234 strikes is pretty good. Don't get me wrong. That's about 10 strikes a minute. But you have your opponent throwing 371 and just showed no signs of slowing down at all. It, it just for every two or three, she was throwing Joanna was answering back with five or six. Um, she just right now was at another level. I'm not really sure if anyone can match that. Of course, I said earlier in the broadcast, you know, this division needs some time to sort out, you know, it's deserving. Joanna kind of gets a break her fourth consecutive title defense, but uh, Jessica and to me seems like the most likely if they need a contender now. However, I still would like to see Andrade get one more fight before I'm willing to say, yup, she gets a title shot. Obviously, there's a big fight coming up in December between Paige Van Zandt and Michelle Waterson. That will hugely impact uh, the title picture as well. You know, Gadella is a little bit on the outside considering she's already lost twice to Yana, but she's going to be a major player in determining who's kind of the next one. Um, of course, Carla Sparza is, is still out there as well. You know, Rose, despite losing to Carolina, she still uh, can be a force to be reckoned with in this division as well. So, um, very, very, you know, a lot of girls right now, this is their opportunity to seize. They can kind of cash in. Um, but I would, you know, say Andraj, if I had to pick somebody today, I would say Jessica Andraj. But with that said, I still would like to see an official kind of contender fight before I'm willing to just hand it over to Jessica. Coming event for the welterweight um, championship, Tyron Woodley against Stephen Thompson. Really, this kind of was a tale of two fights. You had the two very dominant rounds by Tyron Woodley in rounds one and round four, and you had the very um, you know cerebral outpointing rounds by Stephen Thompson in rounds uh, two, three, and five. Now, how this fight played out, you know, I picked Stephen Thompson because I said the hole in Woodley's game is his footwork. He doesn't do well in footwork. So he's a guy that you can back up up against the cage, and he's kind of hesitant to throw, and you can kind of pick him apart that way. In the rounds that Thompson won, 2, 3, and 5, he did that to a T. In the rounds that he didn't, Woodley was able to explode, land one of those big right hands, get, get the fight to the ground, and dominate in that fashion. And in the fourth round, absolutely, you make the case that's a 10-8 round. I really have no doubt about that, and not surprised at all this fight ended up in a draw. If Thompson could have avoided those two, you know, two or three big shots, he would have won this fight easily. And for Woodley, again, he has not corrected that hole in his game in the footwork. And even though he keeps his belt, it's a draw, he was the closer of the two to winning this fight, Still moving forward, the fact that Thompson could take a beating like that, survive a guillotine choke like that, to me really puts the rematch with Thompson being the favorite. 
because Woodley showed no adjustment to that style. He showed no adjustment to being able to being walked down right with his foot right up against the cage. And while, yeah, he had came very close to putting that fight away with his power punches, it's still he's relying on just having that power in his backhand instead of working out the holes in his game. And unless he gets that hole corrected, I don't know if he can beat Stephen Thompson a second time. I mean, Thompson, if there was any doubt about his chin or being able to take a war or fight in brawls, I think this proved it. I mean, he took some of the hardest punches that anybody throws in any division, courtesy of Tyron Woodley, and was still was able to survive. So, you know, uh, I think this fight should be run back. I don't know. I could see Damian Maya dipping in. Obviously, despite uh, this being a five-round four, Thompson took a lot more damage in this fight than Woodley did. So I could see Woodley fighting Maya. Thompson kind of sitting, waiting, recovering to take on the winner of Maya and Woodley. I think that's fair as long as you know Thompson's guaranteed a title shot upon his return. I don't have too much of a problem with Maya jumping in there because Maya definitely deserves a shot at the title as well. Um, but I really think that's kind of what's nice. I know there's there's a lot of Nick Diaz uh, rumors and stuff floating around, but I think Diaz should fight somebody else get an actual win under his belt, um, not just have a great fight, but actually get a win before we can talk about Nick Diaz in, in the title picture. And Conor McGregor fighting, he's got to defend one of his titles first before there's any talk of a 170. Honestly, I think he would get destroyed by anyone in the top of the 170 division, but uh, that's neither here nor there. As I go to the aforementioned Conor McGregor, who defeated Eddie Alvarez, and this fight pretty much went... How I thought it was going to, with Conor McGregor being able to move in and out and Andy Alvarez not being able to come close to hit him. Uh, really, the one brief moment, I think it was towards the first round after dropping Eddie, I think the first or second time, it was kind of close in the cage, and I was like, oh, it's going to be like the RDA fight. But Conor backed away and just let the punches come to him, man. I mean, this was this was a textbook Conor McGregor performance. He didn't really even break a sweat. It's not saying Eddie Alvarez isn't a good fighter, but just his style is kind of tailor-made for the countering of Conor McGregor. It really is. Eddie's not Eddie's not the type of fighter that can really... His style does not match up well with Conor McGregor's style. Plain and simple. Um, RDA, Habib, you know, Tony Ferguson, those guys' styles would match up a lot better as far as being, you know, Nate Diaz. So I'm not sure what's next. I, I would like to think it's Tony Ferguson. He vacates the 45 title, and we see Aldo fight the winner of Holloway and Pettis. That, to me, is the most likely scenario. I, I don't see Connor going back down to 45, and I hope we see Ferguson versus uh, Connor McGregor for the lightweight title. That's my plan. But as far as me technically breaking down, I mean, he did, Connor McGregor did everything he said he was going to do. Okay. Uh, as far as the post fight antics with the belt and everything. Yeah, he should have brought out his 45 belt. Why that was left back in the locker room, I don't know. Um, I don't blame the UFC for not bringing out another belt for him, because to me that fight was for the lightweight belt, not for him in the UFC's minds that kind of had the two belts. That's what Conor was doing it for. But as far as Conor also saying that he wants a piece of the UFC, that's not how it works. You know, the top stars in the NFL don't own the NFL. You know, LeBron James doesn't own a piece of the NBA. That's just not how it works, okay? They want to pay you more money? Sure. But they're not going to give you an ownership stake. I mean, $4 billion? Yeah, you're making a lot of money, but those dudes just spent $4 billion. You ain't got anywhere close to that. <laughs> you know? That's just how it works, okay? <coughs> always gonna The bosses are always going to make the more money. That's just how it is, okay? And even though you're the product on the on the field or in the cage or ring in, the, in this aspect, so... He could say all he wants, breaking all these records, but the UFC uh, survived before Conor McGregor and will survive after Conor McGregor. There's always going to be a new star. There's always going to be the, the next big thing. Right now, he is the big thing, deservingly so. Um, he deserves the accolades. He deserves the dual championship. He deserves the pay-per-view, and he deserves the money. There's no doubt about that, but does not deserve a stake in ownership. All right? There's been some big stars in this organization who have made a lot of money. Anderson Silva, GSP, 
Brock Lesnar, John Jones, you know, those guys have sold some pay-per-views too. So, you know, uh, that's like saying every UFC champion. And yeah, he's the first simultaneous champion. That's definitely an accolade. But Randy Couture and BJ Penn have both won multiple titles in multiple weight classes. So it's not like it's never been done. And then, heck, even right now, David Branch is a multiple champion for World Series of Fighting. I know the UFC doesn't like to mention other organizations, but that's kind of a big deal, regardless of who he's fighting. I mean, he's not taking on UFC talent, but he's, he's still beating the guys he's putting in front of him. You know, he's been impressive. And then, you know, Dan Henderson finished the simultaneous champion in Pride, too. So it's not like it's never been done in MMA. And you can make a case that Dan Henderson fought equally as tough guys as Conor McGregor did. I think that's very fair to say. So I'm not trying to diminish Conor McGregor's accomplishments, but I think a lot of people won't judge this the same way had he had already defended his featherweight champion first. We'll see. You know, only uh, time will tell uh, Conor McGregor's legacy. I mean, he probably already proves himself a UFC champion just by this mere accomplishment. But as far as his true place among the greats, he's going to have to defend the belt. Because that has really has been the truest test of champions. And that's why a lot of people consider Anderson Silva the greatest of all time, because no one's been able to eclipse that record. Mighty Mouse might beat it. And Mighty Mouse might be the, the greatest champion of all time. So uh, we shall see. Only time will tell. But um, I would like to see Conor McGregor against Tony Ferguson next. I know this was a really long show, but I missed it, so it's kind of two shows in one. I like to thank all my supporters here of Beyond the Cage, uh, MMA Fight Club on Facebook, like their page at MMA Fight Club, and of course their brand new website, MMAFightClub.net. Uh, my local uh, Detroit compadres at SportsTalk313.net. Um, thanks again for all the support. Also, uh, AJ Hiller of MMA Signatures uh, USA.com, always supporting the show. Um, Sean Jacoby, um, the owner and CEO of uh, another great memorabilia, not just for mixed martial arts, but all uh, sports and um, collectibles at American Icon uh, Sports as well. Um, also like to thank Top Rated MMA, uh, the MMA community.com, the top site uh, for mixed martial arts forums. Sign up for free. They also do co cool Q Q and A sessions with uh, MMA fighters. That's at the MMA community.com. You can also follow them on Twitter and Facebook. My good friend Gorilla the Bear, the MMA inspired artist who also did the Winter Soldier piece, uh, hit him up for your own uh, very cool original art piece as well. Uh, let's see if I missed anybody. Oh, of course, follow me on Twitter at Jim Graham, on Instagram at the Jim Graham. I'm also on Snapchat at I'm a Hawkeye as well. And like Beyond the Cage at Facebook, facebook.com slash Beyond the Cage Podcast. And of course, you're watching here on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel, please, if you haven't done so already, youtube.com slash Beyond the Cage Podcast. And um, that is it for me. I will hopefully do a video later in the week for UFC Fight Night uh, 101 once all the stuff has been announced with that card. But uh, thanks for uh, bearing with me. And um, this has uh, been a lot, a lot of fun to talk about all these fights that have happened uh, between Bellator, UFC, and, and Glory. And I'm really excited for the next month in combat sports as well. So uh, until next week, thanks for listening to another edition of Beyond the Cage.